So with that, uh, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for tonight. And tonight we have with us our historian, John Kosky. And uh, John received his BA from Mary Washington College, mm -hmm. his master's and PhD from the College of William and Mary. He's the author of several books, but most notably, The Confederate Battle Flag, America's Most Embattled Emblem. And uh, John is in uh, wide demand as a speaker on a variety of topics across the country, but his primary focus is on the Confederate flag, Civil War monuments, and the commemorative landscape of the Civil War. So it makes sense that he is here talking uh, to us tonight about uh, one monument in particular. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to John. Uh, before I do, let me just mention real quickly that if you have a question, you can use your chat feature that's there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we are uh, just having uh, those questions go directly to John. So uh, go ahead and uh, put in questions if you have those. And then at the end of the program, as usual, uh, the speaker will address those questions. So uh, with that, uh, John, take it away. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you for your assistance and, and expertise in setting me up. And if all goes well, I will be switching momentarily to a PowerPoint. Uh, I think I will. Let's see. That gets us there. Okay, so if all goes well, you should be able to see my PowerPoint from there. Okay. And is that, is that all set up, Kelly? It Are looks we, great. It looks okay, good. Very good. So thank you for everything. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I see a lot of familiar names and faces. Um, we came up with this topic more than a month ago. We knew it would be relevant. We didn't know quite how relevant it would be. But unless you've been living under that uh, proverbial rock, you know that um, Confederate monuments and monuments on statues on Monument Avenue have been in the news in the last couple of years. And in fact, the last couple of days, uh, some of you who are not in uh, Richmond may not realize the latest news that uh, it looks almost certain that within the next couple of months, the Confederate statues on Richmond's Monument Avenue will be removed. So that includes the uh, statue that is the topic of tonight's uh, discussion, the Jefferson Davis Monument. But let's pretend for a little bit, although uh, I'll be talking about current events eventually, but let's pretend for a moment that we're back a couple of years earlier in uh, 2017 and 2018. Take us back to the time that Mayor LeVar Stoney appointed a commission, the Monument Avenue Commission, to investigate and make recommendations about the future of the statues on Monument Avenue. Uh, and several months after appointing that commission, very uh, eventful months, the commission reported its findings, which emphasized the need to add context to the existing monuments and to further diversify the statues on Richmond's Monument Avenue. One of the most specific recommendations uh, concerned the Jefferson Davis Monument. You can read it for yourself here. It's obviously edited a bit the length. But uh, pending litigation or changes in state law, which have since been made, to remove the Jefferson Davis Monument. Of all the statues, this one is the most unabashedly lost cause in its design and sentiment. Davis was not from Richmond, Virginia, Richmond or Virginia. The report continues with recommendations specifically about what the, we could do with the various elements of the Jefferson Davis Monument to find new homes for them all. Now, a lot of us saw this coming years ago. I mean, we've been talking about this at the museum for a quarter century, about the possible future of the monuments on Monument Avenue. Uh, so to kind of get ahead of things, I researched and wrote an article you can see the title here, obviously, like alliterative titles, uh, for the museum's quarterly magazine. Uh, this research, the research for the article is based in the minute books of the Jefferson Davis Monument Association, which are in the museum's collections. So the article was based on that, and tonight's talk is uh, based on the, the research in the minute books primarily, which uh, of the Monument Association. I will be addressing the monument's inherently controversial nature and current events at the end of the program, but my primary purpose is this, to give the backstory, as the title of the talk suggests. Why that monument is, what it is, where it is, who is behind it, 
why it was erected, when it was. All monuments, everything on the commemorative landscape has a backstory. Uh, and usually they're more Byzantine than you might know when you look at the finished product. And the Jefferson Davis Monument was especially Byzantine. So let's get right to it. Jefferson Davis was dead to begin with, with apologies to Charles Dickens. He died on December 6, 1889, and was in New Orleans on a trip, on a visit there, and was buried in a tomb at Metairie Cemetery in New Orleans, an arrangement that everybody pretty much knew was going to be only temporary. The movement to erect a monument to Jefferson Davis in Richmond began more or less immediately, two weeks after his death. Here's the first page of the minute book of the Jefferson Davis Monument Association. At a mass meeting of citizens held at the Mozart Academy of Music on Saturday night, December 21st, 1889, it was resolved to organize an association for the purpose of building a monument to the Honorable Jefferson Davis. The officers elected that night were Richmond's mayor and future three-term lieutenant governor, this man, James Taylor Ellison, and as its president. Vice president was one of the leading uh, prominent businessmen and real estate developers, uh, Louis Ginter, and other businessmen and attorneys were the other directors. Not surprisingly, all were Confederate veterans. It was, after all, only 24 years after Appomattox, and all of them, uh, the, uh, all of the citizens at this mass meeting were white. Today, we occasionally read that the monuments, avenue statues were erected a quarter century and more after the after Appomattox. So therefore, it could not, they could not have been anything to do with the Civil War. They must have had something to do with Jim Crow. And I'll talk later about the Jim Crow context of these monuments. Uh, but the timing of why the Jefferson Davis Monument was, was started when it was, has everything to do with when Jefferson Davis died. That's the reason why it was started in 1889. Just as the Lee Monument, seen here, the first statue on Monument Avenue, uh, was, it wasn't dedicated until 1890, but the movement to build it started within days of Lee's death in 1870. So why wasn't the Jefferson Davis Monument finished until 42 years after Appomattox and 17 and a half years after that meeting at the Mozart Auditorium at the Academy? Explaining that, how we got from the first meeting to this dedication in 1907 is my story tonight. Richmond, uh, one thing we need to understand, let me go back for a moment. We, have, we need to understand the full ambitiousness of what uh, the Jefferson Davis Monument Association had in mind. They weren't looking to simply erect one simple monument to Jefferson Davis in Richmond, one among many. They wanted this to be the primary monument to Jefferson Davis in the South and therefore in the United States and therefore in the world. And they also wanted to uh, make Richmond the final resting place for Jefferson Davis. Now to accomplish these things, Richmond had a couple of advantages. One was the presence of his son, Joseph Evan Davis, who died from a fall from the Confederate White House in 1864 and was buried in a modest grave in Richmond's Hollywood Cemetery in May of 1864. The, uh, Richmond also enjoyed a good relationship with Davis's widow, Verena Howell Davis. Uh, now, the, Richmond was not, of course, it was not as the Monument, Associ Monument Avenue Commission noted, Davis was not from Richmond. He was not a Virginian, he was not a Richmonder. And this wasn't exactly where the Davises spent the happiest years of their lives in Richmond, but they made a lot of friendships and a lot of good associations that they nurtured in the decades since. Exploiting these assets, the city sent a representative to the funeral in New Orleans and then passed a formal resolution offering to Mrs. Davis a permanent burial place for her late husband. It was one of several such offers she, re she received, but this one was backed up by the presence of their son, Joseph, and the promise of reuniting the family in death. Now, uh, J.T. Ellison followed up this overture with a visit to led a delegation to New York City where Mrs. Davis was living. And this personal diplomacy paid off when Mrs. Davis told Richmond, told Ellison that Richmond had won the sweepstakes, which is really what it was, a sweepstakes for the body of Jefferson Davis. The city sealed a deal at a reception held for her in 1891. So Mrs. Davis's decision was sort of a fait accompli for other monument associations. A few months later, the, the um, association, the United Confederate Veterans, uh, more or less ceded to the Richmond Committee and agreed to turn over all the monies that had been raised for other monuments to Jefferson Davis for the monument to be built in Richmond. 
The first order of business was to reinter Jefferson Davis's body. And amid great fanfare, in June of 1893, the remains of Davis and three of his four sons were transferred to a new family plot overlooking the falls of the James and Hollywood Cemetery. By 1900, this modest life-size statue of Davis by Julian Zolnay stood on the grave, or over the grave, along with Zolnay's very dramatic uh, statue of, of, of an a weeping angel over the grave of the Davis's daughter, Verena Winnie, who had died in 1898. So reinterring the Davises and bringing them together in death had been the ante that won Richmond the honor, as it was seen then, to erect the Jefferson Davis statue. And for three years, it had consumed a lot of their time and a lot of their funds. Now it was time to get down to business and build a monument. This is Monroe Park in Richmond, um, which was on the western fringe of the city during the Civil War era and a parade and training ground. Late in 1892, three years after the formation, the association decided that the monument would be built here in Monroe Park. The form that the monument would take was not decided, but whatever it was, it was going to be grand. They said that the target for fundraising was $250,000. They issued a formal address to the Southern people, seen here in the, in, the, in the minute book, stating the monument's purpose. It will be an everlasting memorial, not only of the patriot and statesman who purely and bravely led souls, but of the ineffable valor and devotion of the most heroic soldiery the world ever saw, uh, whom he typified while he commanded. And it predicted that the money will be raised speedily. Well, that was before. As you may know, in shortly thereafter, in 1893, America fell into what was until the 1930s, the worst economic depression in its history. Raising money speedily was not going to be so easy. The Monument Association in Richmond was accountable to the United Confederate Veterans, which was going to hold its annual reunion in Richmond in 1896 and see the beginnings of the promised monument. The cornerstone laying for the monument was scheduled during the reunion in 1896. The ribbons were printed up, everything was ready, but what was the monument to be? Only in November of 1895 did the association appoint a design committee, and only in March 1896 did the association announce a design competition. And on June 29th, 1896, days before the cornerstone laying, the design committee met and approved this design by New York architect Percy Griffin for a grand temple. Now, is it just me, or does this grand temple look kind of like this grand temple? Uh, another monument that was all nearing completion on the north side of Manhattan. We know it as Grant's tomb. So the cornerstone was laid in Monroe Park and then nothing for years. The association met sparingly. In May of 1899, their treasurer reported that it, he had raised 20,000 of that $250,000. Faced with these grim economic financial realities, this prestigious, high-powered male officer, group of male officers of the Jefferson Davis Monument Association decided to punt to their wives and daughters. Uh, they induced the United Daughters of the Confederacy to undertake this work, which they would, by their energy, earnestness, and unfaltering loyalty, succeed in accomplishing the desired result. And they passed a resolution to turn over the effort to the United Daughters of the Confederacy. We feel that under their leadership, the monument will be speedily erected. Now, this was not the first time that the United Confederate Veterans, the veterans uh, appealed to their Confederate women to step in and finish a project that they had begun. In 1893, many of the same men, the uh, prestigious veterans and attorneys and office holders asked their wives and daughters to raise funds to complete the Confederate Soldiers and Sailors Monument on Libby Hill. But flattery will get you everywhere. And the United Daughters uh, agreed. They appointed a new central committee, you see here, uh, representing uh, one woman, representing each of the states. This is of the new Jefferson Davis Monument Association. They did keep on the mails as advisors for uh, uh, legal and uh, political interference. The women also scrapped the, uh, the temple design, decided on a more realistic fundraising target of about $75,000, and uh, pushed back the unveiling, the completion date, to 1906, again, more realistic. 
At their first meeting, the new directors decided also to abandon the cornerstone laid five years earlier in Monroe Park. Instead, the monument would be erected here at the corner of 12th and Broad Streets, just off Capitol Square and two blocks south of the Confederate White House. The women also voted that the monument would take the form of an arch over busy Broad Street. And here is, uh, they arranged for a new design competition and for a public display of the contributions in Richmond in June, 18, uh, June 1902. A few months before this highly anticipated display of models, artist models was to begin, Verena Davis dropped a bombshell on the proceedings. In a widely published letter written on March 24th, 1902, Mrs. Davis objected to a triumphal arch and to its location. She reportedly preferred an equestrian statue for her late husband. She pointed out, not unreasonable and rather presciently really, that a triumphal arch to the memory of a man whose cause failed, not for the lack of self-immolation or strenuous effort, but because our troops were outnumbered and he could not achieve the impossible. But for that reason, it is an inappropriate expression of respect for his memory and certainly will excite ridicule in many quarters to have a triumphal arch for a losing cause. The association dispatched a delegation to New York to talk to Mrs. Davis and persuade her of the difference between a triumphal arch and a memorial arch. And they sent back a telegram saying that Mrs. Davis had withdrew all her opposition, provided it was made entirely memorial with, a suitable, with suitable inscriptions. But she seriously objected to the location with the cars running through it, as she thought the idea of a memorial would be entirely destroyed. With Mrs. Davis's approval, the association then selected the design by young Connecticut-born sculptor, Louis Gutebrod. Against their better judgment, the members voted to defer to Mrs. Davis and move the monument to its original location, Monroe Park from Broad Street. Ironically, after having decided to go back to Monroe Park, the association's male advisors, the very men who had laid the cornerstone for a grand temple there in 1896, declared the park unsuitable for an arch. Ms. Marina Davis's preference notwithstanding, the association voted to abandon Monroe Park and went back to the drawing board for a new location. They turned their, locate, their attention westward to what was already known as Monument Avenue. And they considered three different locations, three different intersections of Monument Avenue. Lombardy Street, which would become home to the Jeb Stewart Monument. The Boulevard, now Arthur Ashe Boulevard, which would become home to the, the statue to Stonewall Jackson in 1919 and then a location near the remains of one of the fortifications defending Richmond, shown here with a couple of veterans in the early part of the century. This is, of course, near Cedar Street, which later became Davis Street and Davis Avenue, and where the, the monument was eventually built. Meanwhile, the women had to get working on raising funds. As they did with other projects, the women, the daughters, uh, followed a grassroots approach, soliciting small amounts of money from the UDC chapters, UCD camps, and individuals, and selling souvenirs. And they held a, a memorial bazaar in the spring of 1903. Now, we might be tempted to kind of dismiss this as a stereotypical women's bake sale approach to fundraising, but memorial bazaars had been enormously successful for raising money for various causes in the 1880s, 90s, and in the 1903 Bazaar, they raised a total of $15,000 for the Davis Monument. So six months after the Bazaar gave the association the money it needed to finally get started on building the monument, the association again found itself without a design. Louis Gutebrod had told them that they could not build his arch for the minimum $50,000 $50, then in hand, or $60,000, I think it actually was. So after a rancorous negotiation with the artist, the association voted to abandon the arch and dismissed Gutebrod. Six months. So before the members of the association had the chance to go back to the drawing board, the drawing board came to them in the form of this design by world famous local Richmond sculptor, Edward Virginius Valentine, working in conjunction with architect William Noland, uh, came forward with this design for a colonnade, a, a, a tower and, um, and a likeness monument, a statue of Jefferson Davis. The Central Committee once again met. They were enthusiastic about this, but they were punctilious 
and about following proper protocol. And they knew they ought to have a new design competition before they simply accept a design that fell into their laps. By a close vote, the weary members of the association chose practicality over protocol and adopted the, the design by Nolan and Valentine. Having uh, secured a site and finally a design, it was time to appoint a design committee, building committee and an inscription committee. Now, the one monument that was on Monument Avenue already uh, had a real simple inscription. There it is, Lee, easy enough. But the Davis Monument was a lot more complex, presenting a lot more opportunities for interpretation, discussion, and of course, disagreement. The statue was to, the monument was to include a representational statue of Davis along with a busy and symbolic architectural background. So let's look at all of its parts in turn. What about the figure of Davis? Edward Valentine himself asked the committee, what would they like, a standing figure or a seated figure? The members voted overwhelmingly to depict Davis as a standing statesman. I've always thought it looked kind of like he was hailing a cab, but the architecture would be topped by a female figure named Linda Catrix. There was virtually no discussion of what this meant in any of the minute, in the, in the minute books at all, but we can extrapolate from the earlier discussions that the association wanted the monument to communicate a quote, triumph of principle, a vindication of Davis and his Confederacy. And as I think, as everyone knows, the Davis Monument has more writing on it, and this was true before the last week, uh, more writing on it than any other monument in Richmond, including inscriptions on three of the four sides of the, uh, the pedestal, the dado, dado rather, on which Davis stands. There's also, of course, a colonnade, semicircular colonnade surrounding the statue, and featured on the entablature is a quote from Jefferson Davis's January 21st, 1861 speech when he resigned from the um, United States Senate, giving his uh, reasons, constitutional reasons, for Mississippi's secession in his own resignation. So what did these columns represent? There are 13 of them, which suggests 13 states in the Confederacy. Um, and the question came up because the Maryland Division of the United Daughters complained that their state was not on the equal footing. You can see these uh, round um, metal tablets uh, in the recesses above the quotation. Those are seals and state coats of arms, which was the only way that Maryland was represented. It was not represented by a, um, by a column. But of course, never mind that Maryland never joined the Confederacy. It did contribute troops to the Confederacy and funds toward the, the monument. The chairman of the, the president of the association, Nellie Hotchkiss Holmes, tried to mollify the Marylanders, but they did not drop their protest until the association announced publicly that the columns did not represent states. And consistent with the veterans' original concept of the monument, the finished product included tributes to the service of the Confederacy's land and naval forces on these metal tablets. Now, if sculptor Edward Valentine had had his way, there would have been hundreds more words on the statue. His original design included the defense of the Confederacy based on the principles and precedents of the founding fathers. So many words, in fact, that a member of the association warned that anyone carelessly reading the inscriptions would think it was erected by the Daughters of the Revolution and would wonder what Mr. Davis was doing there. After a prolonged discussion, the association declared that the inscription should be limited to Confederate history. So finally, on June 3rd, 1907, Jefferson Davis's 99th birthday, a year behind the daughter's originally rescheduled date, the monument was unveiled by Davis's only surviving child, daughter Margaret Davis Hayes and her two sons. They pulled the cord to unveil the monument. The estimates of the crowds there that day varied from 80,000 to 200,000 people. Typical of such a events, there were a lot of, a lot of speechifying going on that day, a lot of overwrought rhetoric, a lot of spin, as the speakers sought to define what the monument meant or to exploit the opportunity to make a few points or grind a few axes. One of the speakers was Stephen Bill Lee, a Lieutenant General, General in the Confederacy and the head of the, the Commanding General of the United Confederate Veterans, hinting perhaps at the long time it took to complete the monument. He began 
11 years ago, we laid the cornerstone of a monument to Jefferson Davis. He didn't say where they laid it, of course. We laid it as men lay the cornerstone of a great cathedral in faith that it would someday stand complete, even if it should take, even if we should wait a thousand years. It didn't take quite that long. We are come to unveil a monument to the president of the Confederacy, to the prisoner of Fortress Monroe, to him who suffered for our sake. May all hereafter who shall look upon this monument go hence bearing his image in their hearts. The mayor of Richmond, Carlton McCarthy himself, a veteran of the Richmond Howitzers artillery, accepted the monument on behalf of his city. In the name of this good city, I accept this enduring expression of the firm faith of a proud and fearless people, this noble tribute to a man who, being faithful unto death, is crowned and enthroned in the hearts of the people who knew him best. Virginia's governor, Claude Swanson, well, he was born during the war in 1862, expressed on behalf of the people of the state their profound appreciation of the honor of having erected in Richmond this splendid monument to commemorate the Confederate cause and to give testimony to the abounding and abiding affection which the people of the South entertained for the President Jefferson Davis. This man is le lesser known to all of us, Senator Edward Carmack of Tennessee, he was born just before the war in 1858. He was ostensibly speaking for the President General of the Confederate United Daughters of the Confederacy. Typically, the women, even when they were the ones who were doing most of the work, were not the primary speakers. Sometimes they didn't speak at all. Now, uh, Carmack was also a race-baiting Memphis editor who would be shot and killed a year after this by a rival editor. And he gave an overtly unreconstructed, thinly veiled white supremacist speech that defended Davis, the Confederacy, and the redemption, so-called, of the South from Northern and Negro rule. Referring to the monument, he said, standing in the presence of this noble and impressive monument, we proudly front the world and proclaim to the present and the coming time, this was our hero and his cause was ours. Whether for, cheap, whether, uh, whether for chieftain or for private, we make no confession of wrong. We plead for no forgiveness of error. We ask no tenderness of the future historian. We no charity from the enlightened judgment of mankind. If there are those who are shocked by such sentiments, and you bet there were, let me add that this reunited country will not be best defended by conscious criminals crawling for mercy at the victor's feet. So there. The keynote speaker for the day was Brigadier General Clement Evans of Georgia, uh, who would soon become the, the commanding general of the United Confederate Veterans. In contrast to uh, Carmack's stemwinder, Evans delivered a rather bland biographical overview of Davis, emphasizing the const his constitutional principle, very consistent with the words on the monument itself. It is the honor of Virginia to have entrust the digital of the body of Jefferson Davis. It is an honor to Jefferson Davis to have, the rich, to have Richmond chosen to guard his tomb, he began. He concluded that history will surely give Davis an honorable and distinguished place among the noble characters of past times. All the elements of greatness were components of his life. Now, even in 1907, the statue wasn't finished. Uh, that some of the seals and the uh, other things were not done yet, they were missing. In 1908, on Davis's centennial birthday, uh, during this parade, it was finally finished. Surprisingly, the national press, the national, sorry, press coverage for the Davis Monument unveiling was neutral, usually favorable, congratulating the South on overcoming all the many obstacles to building this. Uh, so far, and I emphasize so far, I found only a few articles or editorials that even hinted at disapproval of building the monument. The few surviving African-American newspapers are almost completely silent about it. But of course, we have to keep in mind that 1907 was near the apogee of the South's often violent imposition of Jim Crow segregation and white supremacy. And in the midst of an era in which much of white America, North and South, accepted or even tacitly approved the South's right a racial order. In the years and decades after the monument's dedication, the monument became, as its sponsors had hoped, the focus of annual Jefferson Davis birthday observations, that one in 1932. Which brings us back to our own time. Uh, let me make sure I'm in the right place. And uh, we have on the city's most famous street, a monument finished 113 years ago that the city's mayor and state's governor 
considered a great honor to have here. A monument that a mass meeting of citizens, that is white citizens of Confederate background, had proposed and demanded to be, to be built. Today, of course, the city's mayor has uh, proposed to take down the statue and the city council is, is going to vote unanim unanimously to, uh, to do that. Uh, and the Virginia governor has passed to sign the legislation making that possible and proposed to remove the one state-owned monument, that of Robert E. Lee, from uh, Monument Avenue. So times have, uh, have certainly changed. Go back this way. Now, the Jefferson Davis Monument, well, let me, uh, I'm trying to find what I printed out earlier and I'm not finding it for whatever reason. Uh, the question I want to explore now is whether we can learn anything uh, from a study of the history of the monument, uh, whether we can bring perspective and uh, background and perspective to what's happening in our own time. And of course, history allows us to do that. What history doesn't, the study of history doesn't do very well, however, is provide a clear course of action. It doesn't suggest a consensus course of action. It doesn't give us unambiguous lessons that we can employ in the, in the future. So with that caveat, let me talk a little bit about what the background and perspective that the history of this monument can give us today. The Davis Monument was the product of an artificial consensus of Richmond's and Virginia's population. The people who made it happen were all white and pro-Confederate. Now stating this might sound kind of conspiratorial, but it really isn't. It's just another way of saying that pro-Confederate white people were the ones who held the reins of power at the turn of the 20th century Richmond. It's as simple as that. And as you can see from the history of this, how this monument came to be, there was all kinds of friction and disagreement and indecision in the story of the planning and the designing and the building of the monument. But what there, never, what there wasn't was any disagreement over the most fundamental question, whether the monument should be built because the people who might have objected were left out of the process. It's a cartoon, a newspaper editorial cartoon from 1919 about holding back Jim Crow, uh, holding back equality in the South and Virginia at large. Was the Jefferson Davis Monument a monument to white supremacy? Well, certainly yes, and that in the fact of its existence is a product of white supremacy. It likely would not have been built where it was, as it was, with public support, the land given to it, if Richmond's African American population had held power commensurate with their numbers. And of course, it celebrates and vindicates a man whose views fit the dictionary definition of racist and who led a nation whose constitution was more explicitly racist than was the United States Constitution before 1865. Now, there's nothing in the official record, the minute books of the association, uh, suggesting that the people who built it intended it to be a monument to white supremacy or to send messages of white supremacy. The words slavery and slave do not appear in the association minute books, and there are no references to slavery or white supremacy at all in the minute books. The stated motives of the people who built the monument were to demonstrate their regard for Jefferson Davis as the leader who suffered their word for the cause he led. And as I've mentioned, they wanted the mo monument to vindicate the cause. It was an effort to demonstrate that they honored Jefferson Davis, even though the cause he led was lost. And to proclaim to the world that although the Confederacy lost, they believed its cause was nonetheless right. And I think most of us can understand, at least understand, why a defeated people would want to find meaning, which is what all of this is all about, finding meaning in defeat, and to put the best possible face on the cause for which so many of them and their families fought, suffered, and died. Understandable as that motivation might be, it does not change the fact that Jeff the Jefferson Davis Monument also embodies and proclaims to future generations a distorted interpretation of Civil War history. Its silence on questions of slavery and race ignores the central importance of those issues in the Civil War and the Confederate cause. Protesters in the last week have addressed that silence with chalk and spray paint. The Jefferson Davis Monument's creators wanted to speak to future generations. It did, and the current generation has spoken back to them. Sorry for the, the this is a out of focus shot, but it's a wonderful 
uh, picture of the Jefferson Davis Monument as it was in a crate being uncrated to um, be erected in 1907. So I thought it would be a fitting slide to have up here while I deliver something of an epitaph for the Jefferson Davis Monument, which will almost certainly be going away in the next couple of months. For 113 years, the Jefferson Davis Monument has stood as a testimonial, a testimonial to a rare and possibly unique event in the US and world history. The losers in a civil war were given an opportunity to construct not only this statue, but an entire commemorative landscape of monuments, street names, place names of all sorts that celebrated their heroes and their cause, their quote, their quote unquote victory in, in defeat, often used phrase. Whatever your personal reaction to this and other Confederate monuments, and I'm sure that those of you watching tonight and participating in this program represent a wide spectrum of reactions, it is useful to understand how unusual and how anomalous these monuments, and this monument in particular, have been. It's also useful to study the backstory of the, how the Jefferson Davis Monument came to be erected, where it is, how it is, when it was. At the same time, to study the process by which the Jefferson Davis Monument and other monuments are coming down. Doing so reminds us that even as we study things in the past, such as the Civil War, such as the creation of Monument Avenue, our own lifetimes are part of history and we are witnesses and participants in history. So I'll conclude with a couple of uh, familiar platitudes. Time marches on, change is a constant. Things never stay the same. It's up to each of us how we react to that change, but it's important that to remember how inevitable it is. And with that, I will stop and take whatever questions. And I can see the questions, so let me let me thank you all. Appreciate that. Uh, hello, Brianna. I didn't seen you before. So the uh, so where is the chat function over here? Okay. Okay, uh, let me kind of go through these and see how many we have and see how many are there uh, are, are uh, overlapping that I can answer them more efficiently. Uh, okay, the, um, what will become of the statues is one of the questions. Uh, and there's, to my knowledge, the statues on Monument Avenue are to be put in storage, not unlike, I guess, New Orleans and Baltimore and St. Louis and other cities whose monuments were taken down several years ago uh, for future uh, uh, disposal. They, whether they will be offered to anyone, we, I should say right up front, I know that the American Civil War Museum is in no position to take them, to store them, to conserve them. And that I know a lot of other institutions have, have uh, made that same point. So it's really quite up in the air about what's going to happen to them. Uh, as some of you know, we have a new statue in Richmond dedicated last year, uh, Rumors of War by Kehinde Wiley, uh, uh, outside the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, that is uh, a um, direct copy, I mean, in scale, a uh, very close copy of the Jefferson Davis, excuse me, of the Jeb Stewart Memorial Monument on that Mon Monument Avenue in Lombardy. Uh, so that rumors of war is a, has, makes a direct reference to that other statue. So to me anyway, as a citizen of Richmond, it makes sense to maybe put the, the, the uh, Jeb Stewart Monument somewhere near rumors of war so that people can see them in tandem. Whether that will happen, I have no idea. Um, the uh, question, what do you make of the fact that Davis was not a popular figure among many in the Confederacy at the time of the Civil War? How did he become, uh, how did that view become eclipsed after the war? Uh, I we should turn this over to my uh, colleague, Brianna Kirk, to answer this, but I'll do the best I can with it. Uh, Brianna's work about uh, Davis's uh, capture and and post-war career. Davis underwent a renaissance and it's a, a pretty good book by Donald Collins about the resurrection, the death and rebirth and re uh, resurrection, I've forgotten the exact title of Jefferson Davis, uh, but how he became, he went from being a goat to a hero. Uh, the process has everything to do with uh, the reference that I read in um, Stephen Bill Lee's speech, how he suffered at Fortress Monroe, his imprisonment 
at Fort Monroe and the mm, somewhat harsh treatment, not harsh if you expected him to be executed, but harsh if you expected him to be treated like a, the head of, an, of, a, of a nation. Uh, that, um, that, imp that imprisonment is uh, being kept in a lighted room for a couple of, uh, about a month, I think it was, and uh, in chain for a couple of days, made him a martyr, a classic martyr. And that began the resurrection process for Jefferson Davis. And in the mid 1880s started being welcomed to um, uh, throughout the South to deliver speeches and to be present at major events. So it was a process that began in short uh, with the, his imprisonment at Fort Monroe and went on from there. And in a sense, he became more popular in the Southern, among white Southerners in the decades after the war and after his death than he had been uh, during the war. Someone else asked, has the effort to erect a monument to USCT soldiers been derailed? No, far from it. Uh, the, I suspect, it, it would be, it'll be likely that the you know, U.S. Colored Troop soldiers, possibly the specific men or some of the men who won the uh, Medal of Honor at Newmarket Heights, east of Richmond, uh, will be um, among those who will be honored on the empty pedestals in Richmond, I think. I've not been very good at predicting anything in all of this, but uh, that seems like a pretty strong suggestion. Uh, Kim Gray, the uh, councilwoman, very influential running for mayor, has um, uh, embraced that suggestion, and I suspect that may even be the first one uh, to be completed. There was, as many of you know, I know at least one of you on this listening and on this knows more than I do about it. Uh, there was an effort to build a monument to the Forgotten 14, those U.S. Colored Troop Medal of Honor winners in Henrico County about 15 years ago, and a working model was created at the time. So we've already got kind of a head start on that, on that statue should the city wish to, uh, uh, wish to do something with it. Okay. Uh, and my other former colleague, Sam, asks, and you speak to the Monument Association's political actions in Virginia's government. Uh, the 1902 Constitutional Convention, uh, no reference in the minute books. If you know something about their behind the scenes work from your study, Sam, uh, send me a chat. But in the, at least in the, in the minute books, uh, there, there's in, 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 in the scrapbooks as well of one of the principal officers, uh, Mrs. Norman Randolph, Janet Randolph, whose manuscript notebooks we have, there was no reference to the Constitutional Convention, but it, it may just be something that didn't show up in the minute books. Okay. Uh, what does Jamestown engraving mean near Davis's feet on the monument? I do not know. Uh, the, let me, I happen to have the um, minute books, my minute book transcription uh right by my side here on the other computer and it's not in the uh uh not in the minute book so it once again may be something um john yeah. is it a question about what was like graffiti that's on there now oh i'm sorry oh i'm sorry so not the um okay so the graffiti not the uh, okay let me go back to that uh in the graffiti let me go back to the share screen here and um, and whiz down toward the bottom. Um, if that were it, was this was this it? Um, current slide. And that's just a guess. So maybe it is. Okay. It may not be. Um, yeah. um, that's not it. Uh, get out of there. A lot of slides that I had in there, but did not show. Okay, so this one, huh? I, I'm, I guess I'm missing that. So maybe I can get back, get out of here, out of uh, stop share, and and look at it again. Okay. Um, has there ever been a discussion about what to do with battlefield monuments to Confederates, such as those at Gettysburg? The to this point, the discussion of it, to my knowledge, and I've limited knowledge about it. The discussion has been uh, the federal government has been uh, pretty adamant about they, they're, they're not being uh, really any question about them. Uh, that may change, I don't know, but to this point, I think being on federal property, they've been kind of out of bounds of a lot of the discussions. There are, as many of you know, many more statues, uh, Confederate statues, not only in Richmond, but around. Uh, some in cemeteries, of course, and some in Capitol Square, including one to Stonewall Jackson that was the first one. It was uh, 
funded and sent over by English admirers of Stonewall Jackson and erected in Capitol Square in 1875, which could be an interesting case if that becomes an issue. Uh, but uh, so the Park Service and the battlefield monuments, particularly those that are on National Park Service sites, that uh, you know, stay tuned. Uh, it, it, to this point, they have they have been sort of out of bounds, but who knows whether that will be well that will continue. Okay, let's see, and we scroll back up. Um, okay, how many? Uh, let's see, some. Is the, is the whole monument coming down or just the bronze statue? Uh, the bronze statues are all those, from, from the dialogue so far, uh, encouraged by elected officials in Richmond and other cultural institutions, the, uh, it sounds like the pedestals are remaining. I mean, this has been something I know Chris Graham and other of my colleagues have been studying this. And the Valentine Museum has um, uh, uh, funded, uh, sponsored some exhibits and other art groups have sponsored exhibits about empty pedestals. Uh, of course, you have to clean up the pedestals now that have been um, covered in graffiti. But um, uh, the pedestals, there's been a lot of discussion over the last two and a half or more years. Uh, and literal and digital uh, suggestions for what to put on those pedestals. So I think the plan is still to keep the pedestals and to put new monuments up, which will of course, and that's what I was talking about, keeping in mind that we're living in historical times too, that five, 10, 15, 50 years from now, people will be studying and signing on for talks like this to talk about. Uh, in 2020, the discussion began about uh, what Richmond wants to see on, on empty pedestals and what does that say about the community, the backstories. There's a lot of backstories, in other words, that uh, for monuments that will soon be erected and they will be uh, as rich and complex and Byzantine as, as the Jefferson Davis, probably given the politics today, uh, even more so. Uh, let's see, somebody asked, how else could Confederates and their ancestors after the war highlight their heritage and their part in the Civil War? And of course, they, they did in many number of ways in history books and writing of history, as well as uh, the creating the cultural landscape. Uh, there's one of the questions that I pose rhetorically, uh, but I think it's an important one, very similar to the, this question, is what realistically do we, would we have expected them to do? Uh, I emphasize in my programs this very unusual, very anomalous moment in which, uh, well, moment, time frame of 20 some years and then more after that, in which the defeated party in a civil war was able to shape the, the commemorative landscape, teach history, influence the entire nation through film and literature as the defeated Confederates have been able to do for much of the 20th century. It was a unique opportunity. And we talk about it like it was some kind of lost cause conspiracy. To me, it's more important that they had the opportunity to do so, that the United States government didn't use whatever power it could have had, the Northern people didn't use whatever white people primarily, they could, they could have had to, in a sense, execute the leaders, send people to education camps, wipe out all their symbols as was done in, in, and forbid the symbols of the Confederacy as was done in Nazi Germany, uh, and make sure that it never rose again. That did not happen. And that, it does not happen. And it was an, an opportunity for white Southerners to memorialize their cause almost completely freely. What in that context would we have expected them to do? Some of you have heard me ask, ask this rhetorical question before. Do we really have, expect them to say, we're sorry, we didn't mean to cause a civil war. We're sorry, we know it was all about slavery. We were just kidding before when we were talking about states' rights. Uh, and we apologized for causing all that damage and destruction. You all are right, we were wrong, sorry. Did we really seriously expect that anybody would do anything like that? Uh, it's unrealistic to have done so. I think any defeated people would have done what the white Southerners did when given this unusual, maybe unique opportunity to erect a commemorative landscape. And I'm not passing judgment when I say that. I'm just trying to examine humankind realistically, which I, I think everyone should. What, let's look at human behavior and, and really ask ourselves if we would have expected it to turn out any differently than it did, given the opportunities that were presented. 
And somebody was, uh, 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 was saying it was, but regarding Jamestown, it was part of the original not graffiti. So I'm just going to assume by that, even though I have nothing about it, this is regarding the Jamestown, that it did not, um, uh, that, it, that it was part, it was a remnant, if you will, of the Edward Valentine uh, 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 recommendation to have the Jefferson Davis Monument refer back to the foundational history of the United States standing on Jamestown. I wouldn't doubt with that in mind that there is some other symbolism regarding the Constitution. So I'm going to kind of extrapolate by what someone has informed me and what we know about uh, uh, the uh, Edward Valentine's original design. And I hope I'm reasonably close in, in making that extrapolation. Okay. Uh, any other questions that I'm... Um, and, and, uh, and I think Chris was referring to uh, one of my colleagues about uh, the... Uh, yes, of course, thank you. For the... Uh, we have an exhibit in the uh, basement of the White House of the Confederacy, which is not yet, again, um, uh, accessible because of the uh, all that's happening beyond monuments these days in our country. The uh, House of the Lost Cause has uh, about Jefferson Davis and his family and a couple of vignettes, if you will, a couple of thematic exhibits in several of the rooms of the basement, one of which addresses the resurrection of Jefferson Davis, particularly beginning with Fort Monroe. Thank you, Chris. And one that I'll, I'll try to uh, answer, it's um, Hard to, I'm not sure whether I can, but it's an interesting question. Did Noland and Valentine have in mind specific European public monuments in this semicircular design with pedestal? To what extent is this design original? Was comment made about Valentine having deserted for Europe throughout the entirety of the Civil War? I do not know the answer to any of those questions. Oh, for three, I have struck out. Uh, the, um, I, I think it's safe to say that they did have uh, uh, precedents in mind in any number of the really good books on Monument Avenue. Uh, Richard Guy Wilson's, I suspect, uh, some of you who have written, uh, read Richard Guy Wilson's uh, coffee table book on Monument Avenue or the one that the uh, uh, Department of Historic Resources Landmarks Division did in the early 90s may very well have that. And I failed to consult those before this talk. So th that, that I suspect is knowable. Uh, Valentine, I did not know about Valentine deserting Virginia for Europe throughout the war, and which of course makes more ironic that uh, he became sort of the court sculptor for the Confederacy, um, along with Moses Ezekiel, who did fight uh, at Newmarket, among others. But uh, Valentine, of course, is most famous for the recumbent statue of Robert E. Lee at um, Washington and Lee University over uh, Lee's grave. Interesting, thank you for that. And Kelly, do you see any other questions that I have missed? I do not have access to the questions. Oh, okay, oh, there you go, I'm on my own. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, that covers all the questions. You all have given me uh, something, two new Okay, two more, two more have come in. Um, yeah, um, regarding uh, uh, following up about the uh, 1902 Constitution and asking more about members like James Taylor, James Taylor Ellison and their political beliefs outside of the association. Yeah, I've, uh, uh, for those of you looking for uh, dissertation topics, and I'm sorry that Brianna here has gone off into the Norfolk uh, race riots, because well, we need somebody to, writes the biography of James Taylor Ellison, uh, who was, when he died, his obituaries say the most important, most famous and well-known man in Virginia. And how many of you have heard of him? <laughs> his papers are divided between the, the MOC collection, now at the VHS, now the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, the v VMHC's own collection, and the Alderman Library at UVA. Uh, we have some fabulous scrapbooks. He was involved in so many things in Virginia in that era. Such an important lost figure. Uh, that Ellison, E-L-L-Y-S-O-N, really needs uh, a major study and the resources are there for it. Um, one of the things I, that about the 
members of an association like this one and people involved generally in Confederate commemoration of this era is that you can make an assumption. And I, I, it's an hypothesis, and I need to be very careful on this, because it is just that, a hypothesis to be tested, not an assumption, not a something proven, uh, not something that is already proven. But you can make an assumption about the racial views of the uh, people of that era, men and women of the Confederate memorial activities, that certainly their racial views were not as enlightened as ours, we would like to think that ours are anyway. Uh, but when I say that, however, some of them will surprise you. And another person who needs a dissertation is Janet Randolph, uh, Mrs. N.B. Randolph, who was surprisingly liberal on matters of gender and race. And there's been some writing on her. So we can make some assumptions and some hypotheses to be tested about the racial views and where these people stood on such issues. And I think it's safe to say most of them are going to be exactly what you would probably think. White Southerners of that era uh, with a Confederate background more than likely were, were in favor of, of, um, of, if not segregation, at least um, uh, disenfranchising the black voters. But every now and then, you're going to find, find people who uh, com complicate in a very healthy sort of way any assumptions that we might make about those people. And let's see, any others? Um, okay. uh, let's see. Okay, Nolan, the architect, wrote letters about his involvement in creating the New South in his letter to his mother. Uh, the capitalized, uh, the new, he capitalized New South, researched by Chris Novelli, sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we have a sense of how those on Monument Avenue, Stuart Davis Lee in particular, towards their own memorialization or the memorialization of the lost cause? Sure. Uh, we, of course, famously, uh, Lee said in the late 1860s that we should build no monuments to him or anybody else. And I think he meant it. So the, uh, the erection of the Lee Monument on Monument Avenue is in a sense against the man's own will. Uh, most people, if they had been alive to say something about it, uh, modesty then is now, uh, you know, aside from a few modern politicians I could name, but I won't, uh, who are probably counting the days till their monuments begin. Um, most people are pretty modest about such things. And what's important for monuments, uh, both in the North and in the South, monuments to specific famous people and explaining when they were built is that I think without exception, the efforts to start the monument associations did not begin until after they died. And uh, we've, there's a blog in our blog post on, on Monument Avenue, the museum's mini site about this, about the, the monuments to Union generals, which were begun later when they died, and often took even longer. The Grant Memorial uh, and by the reflecting pool in the Capitol in Washington wasn't dedicated until 1921, and it wasn't completed until 18, 1924, nearly 40 years after Grant's death. So this this long lapse between the time that a man a leader died and his monument was begun and then started is true both in the North and in the South. Um, but um, so we don't know as a result, I mean, because they weren't built until after they were dead. Uh, we, Stewart never got a chance to opine. I don't know, did Brianna can tell me whether um, uh, Davis ever made any comment to the effect of don't build a monument for me. I've, I've not read anything like that if he did. Um, and um, uh, uh, J Jackson never got a chance. Murray uh, died in the 1870s. To my knowledge, I, particularly for Murray, uh, he would not have thought it likely uh, at that point in his own lifetime that he would have been the subject of a monument. He had a big enough ego, I think, that he, he would like it uh, to have a monument to him. Uh, talked around that question rather nicely, didn't I? Okay. I am not seeing any more. And with that, I think we can, uh, supposed to take, uh, to finish a program like this with something profound uh, that'd be easy to accomplish these days. We're living in profound historical times. Uh, I think the most profound thing I can say is, is stay tuned. And uh, whatever your reactions to it, uh, to all that's happening around you, uh, be reasonable, be, be objective.
objective, keep your emotions in check, try to see everything in perspective, uh, and think like an historian, realize, think like an historian as well as like a citizen, and, and try to appreciate the, um, the very uh, momentous times through which you're living and view it as you would view all that you're experiencing today on your, on, in your own lifetime, as if you were an historian looking back on it a quarter century or a century. I think it'll uh, give you an interesting perspective and perhaps help you transcend whatever your own reaction is uh, to what's happening around you. And with that, I guess I have, do I have it in my power to uh, close the meeting, Kelly? Yes, thank you, John, for an excellent program. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, again, uh, don't forget to donate uh, to us if, if you uh, feel inclined. Uh, we still need your support. But thank you all for joining us.